After several hundred years beneath the boot of an oppressive regime, the Christians of the Roman Empire find themselves in an advantageous position. Not only is their religion now legal, but their rulers are openly advocating for it, breaking with centuries-old traditions. However, some habits aren't so easily broken, and the tradition of religious intolerance was about to come back. But this time, the hunter had become the hunted. This is the story of how pagans in Rome came to be persecuted in their own ancient lands. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. And if you are coming back, it's great to see you again. I hope you're doing well. If you'd like to support the channel, all the videos are available ad-free on the Patreon. Otherwise, if you want YouTube to push my videos out to others, then you can like, comment, and subscribe, but only if you feel like it. Without further ado, let's get on to today's topic, Pagan Persecution in Christian Rome. Nine years after Diocletian's brutal persecution of Christians, Constantine triumphantly entered Rome. Unlike his predecessor, Constantine refrained from partaking in traditional pagan sacrifices, and instead ended the exclusion and mistreatment of Christians. He returned confiscated properties to churches, and adopted a policy of tolerance towards non-Christians, as evidenced by the Edict of Milan in 313. If you want to know about how Christians were treated before Constantine, I have another video on that, too. After 324, Constantine openly embraced Christianity. He demolished some pagan temples, converted others into churches, and neglected the rest. Additionally, he seized temple funds for his own projects and to stabilize the currency. Despite his actions against paganism, Constantine did not entirely halt state support for traditional religious institutions, nor did he significantly alter society's pagan character. Constantine's reign did not witness mass purges or the execution of opponents' supporters. Although laws threatened death for certain actions, no one was executed for violating anti-pagan laws during his rule. Constantine allowed pagans to continue their practices, as long as they did not coerce Christians into joining them. Throughout his 31-year rule, Constantine never outlawed paganism. He actually issued edicts emphasizing peace and tolerance, promoting coexistence among different religious groups. Historians argue that Constantine aimed to integrate the church into broader civic unity, despite his personal favoritism towards Christianity. Well, how did all this come about? Well, Constantine attributed his military successes at the Battle of Milvan Bridge to divine favor. And after that, his reign was relatively peaceful. There is little doubt that Constantine genuinely converted to Christianity. In his personal beliefs, Constantine condemned paganism as idolatry and superstition, while advocating for tolerance. He and his contemporaries did not consider paganism as a legitimate religion. Instead, they viewed it as an outdated illusion. 
his words, not mine. Constantine expressed disdain for the old religion, describing pagan rites as misguided and their temples as places of falsehood compared to the truth found in Christianity. In a letter to the king of Persia, he rejected pagan sacrifices and professed to worship the high god on bended knee. Historians writing after his death claim that Constantine converted to Christianity and was baptized on his deathbed, making him the first Christian emperor. However, Modern observers notes that the story of Constantine's baptism by Pope Sylvester later emerged as a part of a romanticized portrayal of that Pope's life. This narrative aimed to conceal the embarrassment of Constantine being baptized by an Arian bishop, Eusebius of Nicomedia, while he was on campaign in Persia. Although Constantine intended to be baptized in the Jordan River during a visit to the Holy Land, he fell critically ill in that town of Nicomedia. He received a swift baptism by Eusebius before he passed away shortly afterward, on May 22, 337, at a suburban villa named Acheron. Some have described Constantine's policies towards pagans as ambiguous and elusive, particularly concerning the claim that he banned blood sacrifices. There are, however, contradictory sources on this matter who assert that Constantine did ban blood sacrifices and Labanius, a contemporary historian, who suggests that it was Constantius II who enacted such a ban, whereas Constantine sort of turned a blind eye to them, or rather just a willful ignorance. Well, in regards to Eusebius, he explicitly states in his work De Vita Constantini that Constantine enacted a law appointing mainly Christian governors and forbidding any remaining pagan officials from participating in sacrifices in their official capacity. However, other evidence fails to support Eusebius's claim. Constantine's own letter to the eastern provincials makes no mention of any law against sacrifices at all. Modern archaeologists suggest that blood sacrifices were already declining in popularity during Constantine's time, and this was completely unrelated to anti pagan sentiments. Now, while Constantine personally disliked sacrifices and removed the obligation for imperial officials to participate in them, there's really scant evidence of a sweeping ban and there is a little evidence of their continued practice, but very little. All records of anti-pagan legislation by Constantine come from the work of Eusebius, The Life of Constantine, which was written shortly after his death, and many scholars view this more of a panegyric than a historical account. Eusebius' example often interprets laws in a strongly Christian matter, and this leads us to believe that maybe it wasn't as accurate as it could have been. A little biased. But what's a history book without its bias? While it's likely that Constantine did enact a few laws that led to sacrifices in general being banned, or at least their decline, not just blood sacrifices, by the way, but all sacrifices. It led to their decline by the 350s. Paganism itself, of course, persisted beyond this point. 
It's very hard to just wipe that out with a few laws. Polytheists found ways to worship their gods, and the ban on sacrifices certainly had its limitations. Paganism remained widespread into the early 5th century, and continued in parts of the empire well into the 7th century and beyond. This practice contrasted sharply with private activities, such as divination, astrologies, and Chaldean practices. Rituals were aimed at repelling demons and safeguarding the practitioner, which became associated with magic during the early imperial period, that was AD 1 to 30. Even under pagan emperors, these practices existed in their own sort of classification, and they carried severe penalties of banishment and execution. Now, these private rituals weren't just linked with magic, but also with treason and plots against the emperor. Christian emperors inherited this fear of private divination. It was never really seen as a good thing, and completely separate from any traditional pagan practice that the Romans observed. The early church had consistently spoken out against anything associated with what they deemed to be magic. By the mid-fourth century, prophecy had prominent oracles like Delphi or Didyma had been completely suppressed. However, according to Polymnia Athansiadi, the church's primary concern in antiquity wasn't simply prophecy, but theurgy, using dreams to influence human affairs. While the church didn't prohibit dream interpretation itself, it condemned attempts to use dreams for manipulating events, viewing it as deeply problematic. Constantine's decree against private divination didn't categorize divination as inherently magical, however. Thus, despite prohibiting secret rituals like other emperors, Constantine permitted haruspices, the practitioners of divination using animal entrails, to continue their rituals openly. In 324, November, Constantine declared Byzantium as his new capital, naming it Constantinopolis, or the city of Constantine. Surrounded by local pagan priests, astrologers, and augurs, he consecrated the city, although he later returned to Rome to celebrate his twenty-year jubilee. Two years later, on a Monday, November 4, 328, new rituals were conducted to dedicate Constantinople as the emperor's new capital. Notable figures like Neoplatonist philosopher Sopater and Pontifex Maximus Praetextus attended this event. In the May of 330, during the festival of St. Mosius, the city's dedication was celebrated, marked by special coins featuring Sol Invictus. In commemoration, Constantine held a statue of the goddess Tyche, and a column with a golden statue of Apollo, bearing his likeness erected. Historian Libanius, a contemporary of Constantine, wrote that Constantine looted temples across the empire to gather treasures for building Constantinople. This pillaging filled the city with pagan statuary, collected from various cities across the empire. Although Constantine didn't completely destroy what he took, he repurposed it for the new city, deliberately evoking Rome's religious and political past. 
Despite this, Constantinople continued to accommodate pagan traditions, with shrines dedicated to deities like Dioscuri and Taika. While Constantine acquired sites in the Holy Land for constructing churches, destroying pagan temples in the process, archaeological evidence suggests that temple destruction wasn't as widespread as literature claims. Many temples were simply repurposed or remained untouched, but only a fraction of them were actually destroyed. Either way, the decline of traditional polytheism in the Roman Empire was exacerbated further by economic struggles, leading to a decrease in temple construction and the recycling of building materials. Church restrictions aimed to prevent the pillaging of pagan temples, advocating instead for their deconsecration and subsequent reuse. Now, Constantius II, he was known for his stringent measures against paganism, and implemented a series of policies aimed at curtailing its influence within the empire. His approach reflected a personal maxim. Let superstition cease, let the folly of sacrifices be abolished. This mantra guided his decisions, leading to significant actions that reshaped the religious landscape of his time. One of Constantius's notable endeavors was the removal of the altar of victory from the Senate meeting house, a symbolic act that had far-reaching implications. Despite this removal, he allowed the statue of victory to remain indicating a nuanced approach that sought to accommodate his own religious beliefs while navigating the sensitivities of the pagan senators that remained. This diplomatic move showcased Constantius's attempt to strike a balance between his personal convictions and prevailing religious practices of his era, certainly a tightrope that one has to walk. Furthermore, Constantius implemented bans on sacrifices and divination, instituting harsh penalties for those who defied these edicts. Temples were closed, tax relief for pagans had ceased, and severe consequences awaited individuals found consulting soothsayers. However, while these laws signaled a concerted effort to suppress paganism, their enforcement varied across different regions of the empire. Resistance, both passive and active, often hindered the full implementation of these measures, highlighting the enduring popularity of pagan traditions among certain segments of society. In contrast to his successors, Constantius's approach to paganism exhibited relative moderation. He refrained from disbanding Roman priestly colleges or pagan schools, opting instead to focus on regulating and restricting pagan practices. Moreover, Constantius took steps to protect temples located outside city walls, recognizing their cultural and historical significance. This acknowledgement of paganism's enduring presence within the empire underscored Constantius's pragmatic approach to religious covenants. But this was just the beginning. Legislation against magic and divination further exemplified Constantius's efforts to combat practices that were deemed incompatible with his new vision for the empire. By linking these activities and imposing penalties for their consultation, he sought to suppress what he perceived as detrimental influences 
on the society at all. Additionally, laws enacted for the preservation of temples and the punishment of those who vandalized pagan sites demonstrated Constantius's commitment to preserving cultural heritage, even amidst shifting religious dynamics. However, tensions between religious factions occasionally erupted into violence, as witnessed in instances of mob unrest in various cities across the empire. These instances, driven by a myriad of factors, including the aforementioned economic hardships and political strife, underscored the changing of times and unrest during Constantius's reign. People generally don't like it when you try and take their beliefs away from them. Constantius's policies towards paganism reflected a nuanced approach that balanced his personal convictions with careful politics. While his measures aimed to curb the influence of pagan practices, their implementation faced challenges amidst a relatively multifaceted society. Not everybody was on board with the idea, at least not yet. Constantius's legacy, therefore, remains one characterized by efforts to navigate politics rather than make the empire into a completely Christian entity. In comes Julian, who ascended to the sole rulership for a brief 18-month period from 361 to 63, and wielded his power to enact significant changes in the religious landscape of the Roman Empire. Born into a family with ties to Christianity, Julian's upbringing was marked by exposure to both Christian teachings and the philosophical traditions of Hellenism. However, personal grievances against Christianity, stemming from the alleged involvement of his relatives' deaths at the hands of palace guards, fueled Julian's antipathy toward the faith. Upon assuming power, Julian swiftly moved to reverse the policies of his Christian predecessors. He lifted the ban on sacrifices, reopened temples, and sought to diminish the privileged position of Christians within society. Despite advocating for religious freedom in principle, Julian's actions often displayed a bias against Christianity, as evidenced by his prohibition of Christians from teaching and his favoritism towards practitioners of pagan rituals. Julian's attempts at promoting pagan revival encountered intense resistance from various quarters of society, including Christian communities and provincial authorities. Despite his efforts to replace provincial priests with sympathetic associates, Julian found it challenging to garner widespread support for his religious reforms. Moreover, his preference for blood sacrifice faced strong opposition, particularly in cities where Christian sentiments were practiced. While some historians assert that Julian resorted to persecution against Christians during his reign, others argue that his actions were aimed at rather undermining the influence of the Christian establishment, rather than actively persecuting believers. Regardless, Julian's reign marked a significant departure from the partnership between Rome and Christian bishops that had characterized previous regimes. Tragically, Julian's ambitions for religious reform were cut short by his untimely death during a military campaign against Persia. 
the circumstances surrounding his demise remain a little mysterious. With conflicting accounts attributing his deaths to various causes, including religiously motivated assassination attempts. I think whatever the case, upon hearing the news, there must have been a few Christians breathing quite a sigh of relief. Julian's reign represented a pivotal moment in the history of religious conflict within the empire. His efforts to promote a pagan revival, while met with resistance, underscored the enduring tensions between Christianity and traditional pagan practices during the late antiquity period. In comes Jovian. Now his reign, though brief, marked a significant shift in the religious policies of the Roman Empire. Ascending to power in June 363, and ruling until February 364, Jovian prioritized peace negotiations with the Sassanid Empire, and took steps to re-establish Christianity as the favored religion of the state. During this period, the approach towards religious diversity evolved under subsequent emperors like Valentinian and Valens. Valentinian, a Nicene Christian, and his Arian Christian counterpart, Valens, adopted a stance of religious tolerance, allowing various cults to coexist peacefully within Roman society. Contemporary accounts by pagan writers, such as Ammianus Marcellinus, highlight Valentinian's reign as a period categorized by religious neutrality and non-interference in matters of worship. This tolerant stance is further evidenced by the absence of anti-pagan legislation in the Theodosian law codes of the era. Valentinian's policies extended to permitting divination, albeit under certain conditions, reflecting a pragmatic approach that aimed to maintain social harmony while avoiding unnecessary religious conflicts. Similarly, Valens, who governed the eastern provinces, continued to uphold the rights and privileges of pagan practitioners. He retained some of Julian's trusted associates in their positions, and affirmed the exclusive role of pagans as caretakers of their temples. In summary, the reigns of Jovian, Valentinian, and Valens represented a departure from the religious policies of their predecessors, embracing a stance of tolerance and inclusivity, at least as we can understand it in an ancient world context. These emperors sought to maintain social cohesion as the priority, by respecting the religious diversity that was inherent in the breadth of the Roman Empire. Gratian's reign, however, marked a significant turning point in Roman religious policy, particularly with his formal diversion of public financial subsidies away from supporting Rome's traditional cults. Instituting legal measures in 382, Gratian appropriated the income of pagan priests and vestal virgins, stripped them of their right to inherit land, and confiscated the possessions of the priestly colleges. He also refused the title of Pontifex Maximus, and ordered the removal of the Altar of Victory, symbolizing a decisive break with Rome's pagan past. As a result, the colleges of pagan priests lost their privileges and immunities, signaling a shift away from state support from traditional religious institutions. During this period, Gratian sought spiritual guidance from Ambrose, the influential 
Bishop of Milan, exchanging multiple letters and books with him. While it has been suggested that Ambrose dominated Gratian's religious policies, modern scholars argue that Gratian's actions were more likely influenced by changed political circumstances, particularly following the Battle of Adrianople, rather than a mere capitulation to Ambrose's authority. Despite Ambrose's efforts, subsequent emperors like Gratian's brother, Valentinian II, and Valentinian's mother, resisted cooperating with him, and often opposed his initiatives. However, even though they held a dislike towards Ambrose, they continued Gratian's policies by refusing to restore the altar of victory or the income of the temple priests and vestal virgins. Emperors like Arcadius, Honorius, and Theodosius furthered Gratian's legacy by continuing to appropriate tax revenue collected by temple custodians for the crown, gradually diminishing support for urban ritual procession and ceremony. Over time, Many traditional festivals were secularized and incorporated into the Christian calendar, reflecting the ongoing transformation of the empire and Christianity's ascendance. Theodosius' approach to traditional non-Christian cults appears to have been a more cautious and pragmatic one, while he reinforced bans on certain practices like animal sacrifice, divination, and apostasy, he allowed other pagan rituals to be performed publicly and permitted temples to remain open. Although Theodosius converted pagan holidays into work days, the associated festivals continued to be observed. Scholars argue that there is scant evidence to suggest that Theodosius actively pursued a sustained campaign against traditional cults. Instead, he seemed concerned with preventing resentment among the empire's pagan population. For instance, after the death of his Praetorian prefect, Synegius, who had desecrated pagan shrines, Theodosius appointed a moderate pagan to replace him, who worked to protect the temples. Additionally, during his tour of Italy, Theodosius won the favor of the influential pagan faction in the Roman Senate by appointing its members to key administrative roles and nominating the last pair of pagan consuls in Roman history. A notable dispute during his reign centered around that aforementioned altar of victory, with Symmachus advocating for its restoration and the revival of state support for the Vestal Virgins. However, Ambrose vehemently opposed any financial backing for anything to do with paganism, and Theodosius ultimately sided with him refusing Symmachus's appeal. Despite the emperor's refusal, pagans continued to voice their demands for recognition, concessions, and state support. Now, contrary to popular belief, Theodosius did not ban the Olympic Games. Evidence suggests that the Games persisted after his reign and came to an end with his successor, Theodosius II, possibly linked to a fire that destroyed the temple of the Olympian Zeus during his rule. The anti-pagan legislation enacted during the 4th century Roman Empire reflects what some describe as the most potent social and religious drama of the era. From the time of Constantine onwards, 
Christian intellectuals portrayed Christianity as triumphant over paganism, even though Christians remained a minority in the empire. This triumph was perceived as heavenly and evidenced by figures like Constantine. The laws introduced during this period were not aimed at conversion, but rather at terrorizing the pagan population with vehement and often horrifying language. The primary objective of these laws was to reorder society along religious lines and put an end to age-old practices such as animal sacrifice, which to the Christians was deeply abhorrent, even though their grandfather was probably doing it. While private pagan rituals could not be entirely stopped, Christians sought to control what was considered normative and socially acceptable in public spaces. Altars used for sacrifice were frequently destroyed by Christians, who found the sight of slaughtered victims repugnant and reminiscent of their own past suffering associated with such practices. Despite the severity of the imperial edicts, their impact was limited due to widespread following of paganism among the population and the passive resistance of many of the local authorities. Christian bishops often obstructed the implementation of these laws, further limiting their effectiveness. However, while the influence of imperial law was not absolute, it still played a role in shaping societal norms and attitudes. The emergence of a language of intolerance in both legal texts and Christian writings reflected a rhetoric of conquest, with Christian authors portraying paganism as already defeated and deserving of universal contempt. This rhetoric had a significant impact on modern perceptions of the period, contributing to the belief in continuous violent conflict between Christians and pagans. However, archaeological evidence suggests that such conflicts were relatively isolated, and non-Christian groups like pagans and Jews generally enjoyed a level of tolerance based on contempt during late antiquity. Theodosius was a devout Christian who was eager to close down pagan temples in the East. His commissioner, the prefect Maternus Synegius, carried out widespread temple destruction, even utilizing the military and black-robed monks, sounds very sinister, for this very purpose. Despite the actions of these monks being deemed unlawful by the pagan historian Labanius, Theodosius didn't enforce any laws against them, passively legitimizing their violence. Instances of temple destruction were seen as indicative of a broader trend of violent Christian iconoclasm throughout the 390s and 400s. However, archaeological evidence for such destruction in the 4th and early 5th centuries is somewhat limited, with most recorded incidents known only from church accounts. These accounts often dramatize pious bishops battling temple demons, contributing to the perception of widespread destruction. The discrepancies between literary sources and archaeological evidence may arise from the ambiguous nature of the details in the former. For example, conflicting accounts in historical sources like Malalas regarding temple destruction by emperors such as Constantine and Theodosius further complicate the picture. 
Some archaeological research suggests that only a small percentage of known temples in regions like Gaul, Africa, Asia Minor, Greece, and Egypt show evidence of violent destruction during this period. Earthquakes, civil conflict, pragmatic use of material, and conversion to churches explain much of the temple damage, rather than deliberate anti-paganism. Contrary to the belief that many temples were converted to churches, modern evidence suggests that only a fraction were repurposed, with the direct conversion of temples into churches not becoming widespread until the mid-fifth century. The Pantheon, in Rome, for example, was not converted into a church until 609, and many of the churches attributed to figures like Martin of Tours cannot be definitively traced back to the 4th century. Anti-pagan laws persisted beyond Theodosius, extending through the reigns of subsequent emperors, such as Arcadius, Honorius, Theodosius II, Marcion, and Leo I. These laws reiterated bans on pagan practices, like sacrifices and divination, and often the penalties would continue to increase. The need for such laws indicates that paganism still had significant followers, including sympathizers and crypto-pagans in positions of power within the administrative system. While public sacrifice ended in major cities like Constantinople and Antioch during Theodosius's reign, enforcement of these measures varied outside the imperial court. Away from the center of power, such efforts were less effective and endured until the 5th and 6th centuries. By the early 5th century, under rulers like Honorius and Theodosius II, laws against magic and divination became more stringent. For instance, a law in 409 targeted astrologers, ordering them to convert and burning their books of mathematics used for computations. Despite Christianization efforts, some regions retained substantial pagan populations well into late antiquity. For example, the prefecture of Illyricum and the city of Aphrodisias housed significant pagan communities, including philosophical schools. In Rome, the elite remained largely pagan, and institutional cults continued to exist in reduced forms, funded privately. Discoveries at Aphrodisias and Athens challenged the notion of pagans worshipping in secrecy and fear. Overt pagan statuary and altars found in these cities suggest that paganism persisted openly, despite legal and literary betrayals suggesting otherwise. In 476, Romulus Augustulus, the last Western emperor of Roman descent, was deposed by Odoacer, marking the end of of the Roman Empire in the West. Odoacer became the first barbarian king of Italy. By the time of Emperor Anastasius I ascended the throne in 491, the Goths, who had established themselves in Italy, had been Christian for over a century. Some argue against the notion that late antiquity witnessed a wholesale process of Christianization of the empire. While certain cultural and social changes did occur, they did not necessarily reflect an overall Christianization. Instead, 
a public culture emerge that could be shared by polytheists, Jews and Christians alike, albeit with Christian influence, mainly in the elimination of blood sacrifice. In fact, many have suggested that a truly Christian empire did not emerge until the time of Justinian, also known as Justinian the Great, 527 to 565, who played a significant role in integrating Christian ideals and legal regulations into Roman law. He made revisions to the Theodosian Codes, incorporating Christian elements, and enacted legislation against practices like sacrifice well into the 6th century. Justinian's government became increasingly autocratic, and he persecuted pagans, religious minorities, and dissenters within the bureaucracy. This zeal for religious and cultural uniformity led to conflicts, including with Rome and the eastern provinces. Under Justinian's reign, there was considerable destruction associated with the supremacy of Christian belief. He ordered the persecution of surviving pagans, including the burning of pagan books, pictures, and statues. This persecution, accompanied by the destruction of pagan literature, occurred at Kynregon. Many ancient texts, mostly on perishable materials like papyrus, were lost due to active persecution during Justinian's rule, making it somewhat challenging to assess the extent of the losses attributed to Christians. Thank you very much for joining me. We've reached the end of our discussion for today. Whether it be this morning, this afternoon, this evening, whatever time you're enjoying, I hope you've enjoyed it thoroughly. I'd like to thank my Mega Chad tier Patreon Stark Factory for his support. If you would like to support the channel, head on over via the links in the description and comments and you can view all of the videos ad-free on the Patreon, and have my eternal gratitude for helping keep this channel going. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Good night, everyone.